So have you ever wondered what uh, the difference is between the mother tongue, dominant language, heritage language, and what languages actually we, we speak in a multilingual family? Hi, I'm Ute from Ute's International Lounge, and I help multilingual families maintain their languages whilst living abroad and embracing new ones. Now, we can speak multiple languages in our family, and it can be that we speak two or three or even more languages in our family, right? And I hope that you all chose the primary language, one that you are fluent in and that you use spontaneously, and where you are naturally expressing your emotions in as a primary language. Now, let's talk about mother tongue. The term of mother tongue is used in many different ways across cultures and languages, and I find it interesting to see what people associate with them. So maybe you can let me know in the comments below what you associate with the term of mother tongue or mother language. Now, the origin of the term mother tongue harks back to a notion of linguistic skills of a child are honed by the mother, and therefore the language spoken by the mother would be the primary language that the child would learn. In 2011, the UNESCO published a document entitled uh, Enhancing Learning of Children from Diverse Language Backgrounds, Mother Tongue Based Bilingual and Multilingual Education in the Early Years. Now, the organization is very aware of all the discussions, publications and researches on the field of languages. And it defines what the mother language is in the following way. So I quote, the term mother tongue, though widely used, may refer to several different situations. So definition often include the following elements, that the languages uh, that one has learned first, or it is the language or languages one it identifies with or is identified as a native speaker by others, or these are the languages or the language one knows best and those one uses the most. So mother tongue may also be referred as the primary or first language or L1. And the term mother tongue is commonly used in policy statements and in the general discourse on educational issues. End of quote. So most of the time in official documents, the term mother tongue refers to the language of primary schooling, which does not necessarily correspond to the first experiences a child or a person has with the language, not in multilingual families where children are schooled in an additional language. So that's the first thing to consider. Furthermore, it has been written about this concept many, many times in various ways, and it is extremely difficult to define. Let's think about the basics, mother tongue. You think about the mother as primary caregiver of the young child. And what about the father tongue? Mother tongue refers to a very traditional or conventional family situation where the mother is a primary person transmitting the language to the child and is the main or sole provider for input in that language. This scenario is not accurate in today's world, where fathers and other caregivers are very actively involved in providing input in the home language or home languages. Furthermore, in multilingual families, we often have two or more languages as primary languages or L1 or mother tongues, mother languages or parent languages, so to say. So that would rather mean that we have two, three, four parent or caregiver or home languages. Also, what about adopted children? A friend of mine was adopted when she was two years old and she grew up in a Dutch family. This was in Italy. And would then her mother tongue be now Swahili because her biological mother spoke Swahili with her or Dutch, the language of the adoptive mother? Mother tongue or father tongue or a term that I prefer the home language and languages are the first languages we were exposed to, chronologically speaking. As for the term of native speaker, which is used interchangeably with L1 or mother tongue or father tongue by many, this term actually has mud on its face, like Jean-Marc de Valle, Thomas Bach and Lourdes Ortega emphasize in their article, and I quote from the abstract, and you're welcome to read that article, um, the article's title is Why the Mythical Native Speaker Has Mud on Its Face.
the terms of native speaker and non-native speaker actually continue to be widely used in applied linguistics and foreign language learning and teaching, despite a growing wave of criticism about the difficulty in defining them accurately. The neo-racist ideology they reflect and the deficit view they perpetuate among foreign language learners and teachers. These issues are explored in more detail in this article, focusing on the history of the terms of native speakers and non-native speakers and their enduring perverse social consequences. We consider the authors alternative views and explain the reasoning behind the development of a new terminology, which is L1 user versus LX user by Devale in 2018. The authors conclude that the fields need to abandon the toxic terms of native or non-native speakers and adopt neutral terms that emphasize the equal status of first and foreign language users, which can often be the same person." End of quote. So what they suggest is that instead of native speaker or non-native speaker, uh, we should rather use terms like L1 and LX user, while the X stands for any additional language. We also have then the dominant language, which is the language we are most fluent in. We have the greatest proficiency and or use more often and at any moment or uh, of our journey. In fact, our language dominance can change over time, and it depends on whether we need or use that language in our daily life or regularly or not. So that term rather explains the proficiency and the importance or role the language plays in our everyday life in a language. Larissa Aronin talks about dominant language constellation, and we can actually have between two and four languages in the foreground that are most dominant for us. So to get more aware of what language or languages we use most, there are activities like a language portrait, or we can put them in a language timeline, for example. The next term is the heritage language or heritage languages. Let me just share with you a very general definition because there are many of them as well. The heritage language would be a minority language, either uh, immigrant or indigenous, learned by its speakers at home as children, but never fully developed because of insufficient input from the social environment. There, the speakers grow up with a different dominant language in which they become more competent. And heritage language can be the minority language we speak with our children at home when this language is not taught at school or in formal settings. And this is very often the situation of multilingual families when we raise our children abroad and when our languages are not supported by the community. As I personally find it already very difficult to navigate these terms and settings like uh, at school, the community and across languages, I thought I'd share with you what I have come up with. We can try to organize these terms depending on the chronology, the level of proficiency and the level of proficiency and importance and then the level of support in the community. So chronologically speaking, we can distinguish between the first languages and every additional language, okay? So the first languages can be the ones that uh, the mother, the father, or the mothers, the fathers, depending on the um, family constellation, transmit to the child in the first years. It can also be the L1, whereas the additional languages can be defined or labeled with uh, L2 or L3, or like uh, De Valle suggests, LX, yeah? We just uh, fill in the space. When we consider the level of proficiency in the languages, we have uh, maybe a native language, if this is the first language, and then uh, the additional languages become uh, maybe the non-native uh, level of fluency or the non-native languages. There is also the term of nearly native language, which can be a high proficiency that we achieve in an additional language. Um, but I don't want to get there in this video. There is also the level of proficiency and importance in everyday life, and this is where the dominant language comes in. So the dominant language can be a language that we either is the language one or the, the mother tongue, father tongue, home language, <laughs> whatever other term we want to use. 
but it can also be an additional language where we have gained a very high level of proficiency and where this dominant language actually is part of our daily life and we have uh, are very fluent in and very spontaneous in we can also express our emotions maybe so it's a continuum actually then we have the level of support in the community. When it comes to the level of support in the community, we have those languages that are supported and shared by most part of the community. And these are then usually the standard languages or the majority language. And then we have those who are uh, less supported or ha have a lower support um, from the community and is they are shared by a smaller group and these are then very often called the heritage language or the minority language or the minoritized language. I personally don't like that term of minority language because a minority language is always uh, in a setting like I say here so depending on the community we are living in whereas every minority language can be a dominant an important language in a certain setting and usually in the micro society, which is the family. So I hope that you like this video and uh, if you have any further questions, I'm very happy to discuss it in the comments here below and maybe at one of my free online meetings on multilingualism that happen every last Friday of the month between one and two o'clock Central European time. And if you like this video, please click subscribe and click the bell to be notified each time I publish a new video.